This Week in Radio Tech, episode 141, is brought to you by the Omnia 11 FM audio processor in its new FM only configuration. Omnia 11, everything you hear is true. And now, our feature presentation Twerk. Put that coax up right, or it could come crashing down. And who are you going to call when every backup system fails? All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? Yeah, yeah. All your days are belong to us. Yeah. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin join me to chat with Stephen Wilkinson, engineer at Hope 103.2 in Sydney, Australia. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, this is the show where we talk about audio stuff. And sometimes RF stuff and tower stuff and political stuff and monster cable and whatever else we can argue about. Uh, if, you, if you're an audio nut, if you just enjoy audio, if you love the drama of, uh, of hearing stuff on the radio, connecting with a voice there, you know, uh, or just like tapping your toe to music or singing along in the car, this is a great show to listen to because we tell you what goes on behind the scenes. Let's talk right now and bring in some of the guys who do the stuff behind the scenes. First of all, a couple of my uh, co-hosts have been with us since day one when the show started. Uh, first of all, the best-dressed engineer in radio, it's uh, Chris Tobin from Manhattan, New York. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kirk. All right. Yeah, I've uh, just been here from the beginning. We've been having a good time, and now on a new network, it's even more fun. And uh, I, work, I work with the Music Cam USA folks. So we do codecs for disclosure, IP codecs for video and audio. And just want to make sure everybody knows that so there's no, no problems. I had a couple of emails from folks. Keep them coming in. It's been great asking questions about different stuff for radio. And uh, in the past, I've done about 20-plus years of radio and some television with uh, CBS, ABC, Westwood One, uh, and a few uh, private broadcast groups. It's been a lot of fun and continues as I helped folks out. And as earlier, we, I was talking with Chris Tarr. I've been doing some more stuff with uh, uh, non-coms. Uh, some uh, public radio stations here in the vicinity. And it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Different, a different mindset, as Chris pointed out. Very cool. I'm glad you're with us. And hey, Chris, just uh, it, it just dawned on me. We need to uh, uh, get you and me together, or uh, you, your engineers, and our engineers together. I want to get some connectivity between your IP codex and the Telos IP codex. We can just you know see what modes they work in. Uh, I, I guess you know, ours are NASIP compliant. Uh, it's always good to check that out. Uh, I, I would imagine uh, yours uh, either are completely or partially or something. Yep. So it'd be great to to get to you know just have our own little plug fest across the what you know 800 miles that we're separated by yeah sure yeah, yeah we're fully uh nasip tech th uh, tech bulletin was it 3326 we support all the algorithms and uh, we already talked to the other two codex out there so yeah i'm sure we probably i'm pretty sure we talked to yours i think uh, a couple of your guys are on the ebu yeah. board along yep. with mine They've they've had plug fests about that and and you know are happy with the way things are working but I, I you know I'm the kind of I was born in the show me state Missouri and I always like to have the conversation saying, yep I've done that it works it's always good to know oh, hey yeah, also no, no problem yeah also with us on the show another fellow who's been with us since day one uh, what 141 episodes ago Chris Tarr from Muckwanago, Wisconsin hey Chris welcome in thank you very much I am the uh, director of operations and engineering for 88.9 Radio Milwaukee. Uh, I'm also a uh, contributing writer to Radio Guide magazine. I run the website uh, Virtual Engineer and oh, so much more. <laughs> well, we're going to hear about some of that oh, so much more because I want to know what non-engineering things you've been doing uh, just this week. And not only you've been doing them because you're a non, you're working at a non-com now. That means occasionally you raise money. Also, yep. we have a guest on the show who also works at a non-commercial station. Although the rules may be a little different uh, down under. Let's welcome in from Australia, Sydney, Australia, Stephen Wilkinson. Hey, Steve, welcome in. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be on uh, Twit that I watch from time to time. Well, it's good to have you here. Hey, Stephen, tell us a little bit about the station that you are with and what you do there. Um, I'm the technical operations manager for Hope Media, which is a FM service of 103.2, Hope 103.2 on FM in Sydney, Australia, and also Inspire Digital on um, DAB+. Plus. Um, we're a not-for-profit, so yeah, we're similar. We, we're allowed uh, five minutes an hour of, if you like, advertising, sponsorship, and uh, yeah, that's we're mainly listener-funded, and uh, we... 
probably our income would be about 55% uh, listener funded and uh, uh, 45 or so is uh, from sponsorship. We're, Stephen, in this episode, you've got a story to tell us that it's it's like a war story, but we're not going to wait nine more episodes for another war story episode to, to put your story on. You've got an incredible story to tell about redundancy and how I, I guess you never can have too much of it. So hang on to that story, kind of develop that in your mind how you want to discuss it because I am eager to hear about it. And uh, viewers and listeners, you're going to want to stay tuned for Stephen Wilkinson to tell the story about how when everything goes wrong, <laughs> <laughs> how you reach and yeah, how you just reach it, back. It, it wasn't a fun over. day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in the end, though, you you got something going, didn't you? It yeah. Was, yes. Just, got to go. There, there's a there's a ha there's a happy ending to it. Hey, I just want to kind of uh, pass the pass the baton around here and uh, see what's going on in everybody's world. Uh, tell you what, I'll start. Um, this week, I had an opportunity to run down to uh, some radio stations in Mississippi that I'm part owner of. So, as I mentioned, I, I own the part that doesn't make any money. Um, and we had a a few months ago, we had a real problem down at these radio stations in Mississippi. Um, at one of them, we had a big thunderstorm come through with some incredible straight line winds and on uh, one of our stations the coax apparently now this is the main transmission coax is inch and five eighths uh, you know plastic jacketed uh, coax uh, air dielectric about 330 or 40 feet worth of that going up the tower um, that coax departed from the tower at least about the top half of the coax did. It jerked itself loose from uh, a connection. There was actually a 7 8 inch jumper. Uh, this is 7 8 inch coax, a jumper for about the last, oh, 15 feet or so between the top of the inch and 5 8 coax and the input to the antenna. And uh, it, it jerked f uh, clean from that. It snapped. And then the it, apparently it, the coax got started falling and then it just rip, 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 whatever was holding it up. And unfortunately, I don't know that it was done all that well. It may have been cable ties and tape for all I know. It certainly wasn't the usual uh, butterfly hangers that you're supposed to use for this kind of coax. So, they, I mean, this is in rural Mississippi and, and you know, no money to speak of. And you know, apparently when you don't do things right, uh, you suffer the consequences. Well, this coax just ripped off the tower uh, to about the halfway point. And it it was it fell over as it because it's heavy and it fell over and was stopped by a Scala paraflector STL antenna and so now the coax is looped over this Scala paraflector which amazingly didn't budge <laughs> it just stayed there and and broke the fall if you will of this inch and five eighths coax so now the coax is bent it's kinked right there at the Scala paraflector it's hanging down. Uh, I guess I, it's touching the ground because yeah, uh, more than half of it, the Scala paraflector is not quite halfway up the tower. So the coax is, is, is dragging the ground. And, um, well, luckily, uh, this station had a backup system. Um, and it was a not a full power backup system, but we had a backup transmitter, backup coax, backup antenna all on, on the tower. And so um, – that was good having that much backup because, you know, when your coax rips free, let's see, your coax is out and that antenna to which it's connected is now out. So we had a backup coax. I think it's just um, half inch coax leading up to a two bay antenna. And the transmitter that we had available to feed it uh, is a kilowatt solid state amplifier. It's fed by um, a little 30 watt uh, exciter. So um, we have been on the air. By the way, this happened back in June. So we had to file an STA with the FCC to you know let them know, hey, we're on a reduced power level until we get this coax fixed. And uh, so we've op operated now on this uh, backup um, transmitter and backup antenna uh, since whenever this happened in, in late June. Well, we finally got around to being able to get a tower crew out there. Uh, and um, um, I'll make a long story short. I know I've already made it kind of long. We had available some used coax to put up the tower. Uh, the length was just fine. We had you know 350 feet of used coax, inch and five eighths air dielectric. The problem was this coax was not really properly stored. When you store air dielectric coax, you ought to store it in a dry place. And if you can't store it in a dry place, the coax needs to be pressurized internally to keep any moisture out of it. Well, that wasn't done either. So this coax was outdoors. It was on a spool. It was properly. Uh, it was taken out off of a a tower that 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 we used to own. It was working when it removed from service, so far as we knew. Um, 
and it was spooled up on a wooden spool, the same kind that it came on. Uh, but the end of it, that the uh, one end was a gas barrier, uh, inch and five eighths connector. The other end was a gas pass inch and five eighths connector. But you know what? I think it, it may have been cut off uh, in the in the process of taking it down. So anyway, there was a plastic bag over the end of it, taped up, which you know. Okay, kept birds and bugs from going inside, but it didn't keep the moisture from coming in uh, with the coax stored outdoors. And for those of you who wonder, well, how would moisture just get into some coax stored outdoors? During the daytime, sunlight is beaming down and, and hitting the black jacket on this coax, and the air inside warms up. It warms up more than the ambient air outside. So what happens if there's any pinholes or leaks? Uh, the pressure of the inside air um, inside the coax is now higher because it's warmer, and so air goes out, leaks out of the coax. Just a little bit will go out un until the pressure equalizes inside and outside the coax. Well, at night, it cools back down. And so now the pressure is lower inside the coax, and so ambient air leaks back into the coax every night. And this ambient air is not necessarily dry, especially if you're storing it in, you know, eastern Arkansas or uh, western Mississippi next to the Mississippi River. So it's pretty moist air getting sucked back in. Well, the next day when air heats up and leaves again, guess what? Just the air leaves, the moisture, a lot of it stays in, in, the, in the coax. It, it, it condenses inside. And so after doing this dozens or hundreds of times, what ends up happening is you get water collecting inside the coax. And this is why coax, air dielectric coax, is pressurized at transmitter sites and also elliptical waveguide. That's why it's pressurized. Just enough, doesn't have to be much. You know, we're not talking about 30 pounds of pressure like a tire here. We're talking about just a pound or two or three of positive pressure. And either dry air from an air dehydrator is used or nitrogen is used, dry nitrogen, because it's dry. Well, uh, bottom line is, no pressure on this coax. Water was in it. Uh, the tower crew looked at it, and, and I wasn't there. I hadn't gotten there yet. The tower crew says, you sure you want to install this? It may not be good coax. And I talked it over with uh, the, our business partner, and he said, well, we don't have money for any other coax. Let's put it up and take our chances. So we put the coax up, and you can guess what happened. It's not a happy ending to the story. Lots. When we finally got it, got all connected, uh, and I, at the bottom inside the transmitter building was my job. I put a new inch and five eighths connector on this coax, brand new one, and uh, put my bird watt meter in line, the the line section that that checks the power going forward or reflected either way. And then uh, we had a jumper, seven eighths jumper that goes to the top of the transmitter. This transmitter is a thirty five hundred watt transmitter. In fact, it's the same transmitter that. On this show, a couple of years ago, I did a video to show you changing uh, out the, the, the tube in, in the transmitter. Um, so we got that done, or maybe it was the, the blower. But anyway, we had a bit of video about that. Well, fired it up, and the power ramped up, and it reached a point, cut back off, because the reflected power was also ramping up about the same time. Well, we honestly didn't know if it was this coax that was bad, or perhaps there was something else bad up uh, at the antenna, where you know the storm had snatched this uh, big coax away from the antenna. So we had to figure out, okay, what are we going to, uh, what, what are we going to do? Well, we, it turned out the tower crew was available to come back. And I found an, uh, a dummy load, um, uh, a 100 watt dummy load. And I found an adapter to go from inch and five eighths coax down to an N connector, which is what the coax, uh, what the uh, dummy load had on it. So Got the tower crew. They climbed the tower with the 100-watt dummy load, a little jumper cable with end connectors on it, and this plate reducer to reduce from inch and five-eighths down to an end connector. We had them separate it from the jumper that was up there, put the dummy load on it, and I fired up just the exciter. I put an exciter uh, you know, capable of a couple hundred watts uh, into the bottom of the coax, and we had reflected power there too. So I, I, And I had tested the dummy load on the ground. Um, and it, it gave no reflected power whatsoever. So the dummy load was a good, solid load. So that proved, uh, without having any fancier equipment like, uh, you know, an, an admittance bridge uh, or that kind of thing or a time domain reflectometer, nothing like that, that proved pretty simply but effectively that, yep, there's something wrong with that coax. There was a place about halfway up the coax where the coax had actually been weakened and may have been kinked right there uh, just enough to cause a problem. And I'll, I'll mention that to you, too, because it's, it's, it's a factor that I hadn't really thought about. When you put coax on a tower, uh, in most cases, you should put grounding kits on the coax. And uh, grounding kits involve removing some of the plastic jacket, attaching the grounding kit, uh, weather, going back and weatherproofing 
uh, around there with uh, uh, you know that that gooey tape. It's, I'm sure it's got a name, and then putting a you know electrician's tape over that, or you know the big wide stuff, and then taking this grounding kit which has a cable on it, attaching that to the tower somewhere. So you ground it in several places. Well, it turned out it, it turns out that when you remove the plastic jacket, you actually do weaken the coax. You weaken it in terms of if you're going to remove it from the tower and roll it back up. Where that jacket no longer is, the coax is weaker. It's just copper at that point. It's kind of uh, corrugated is the wrong word. I'm sure there's a word for it. Somebody jump in and tell me if you know what it is. Um, uh, where the coax will bend, right? Well, you got to be real careful putting it on a spool. And then when you take it back off the spool, wherever there was a grounding kit because it's not as strong there and it could actually kink a little bit right there. And if you, if you move, flex it several times – in the course of removing the coax or putting it back on somewhere, you can end up with a busted, uh, you know, with a leak or a, uh, in, in the outer conductor. And the inner conductor, you know, may end up, you know, impinging somewhere to the outer conductor. So all that being said, we had, yeah, this used coax can be bad news. That's what I'm getting around to saying. And for us, it certainly was bad news. Well, um, in, in the end, what we've done, we're ordering some new 7 8 inch coax. It turns out that this antenna that we're using is not pressurized. It's a low-power kind of an antenna. And so we're going to use a 7 8 inch foam dielectric coax. Um, with the foam dielectric, we can, um, uh, uh, you know, put, uh, put uh, uh, grounding kits on it without them causing as much problem because the foam inside provides uh, some, some uh, resistance to, to bending uh, or some stability inside there. So I'll report back to you when we get all that done. We'll have a single run of 7 8 inch coax going from the output side of the bird watt meter in the transmitter building uh, all the way up to the input on the power divider of the antenna. Well, there's your lesson for today. Be careful about used coax. We learned that the hard way this week. We took a gamble. You, we knew it might you, not uh, work. Did and you purge that out. line after you, when you put it up or did you just fire it up right away? I'm sorry. Say again, Chris. Did you purge that line when you put it up there, or did you just fire it up right away? Actually, actually, we we, we purged it. Well, we didn't have the ability to. We, we didn't have a pop off cap at the top. So what I did was um, I filled the line up twice and let it uh, escape twice. Um, the coax had been vertical for a couple of days before I got there because the tower crew had put oh, it up. Okay before I got there. So if there's any water to run out, it would have run out. Now, there certainly could have been drops of moisture up in the coax, but a drop, you know, a little bit of moisture here and there isn't going to cause the kind of, we, we got almost 100% reflected power. We put uh, so uh, 100 watts an forward and, and we were getting, you know, 90 watts back. Yeah. Um, it's possible that there was, heck, moss and mildew growing inside that coax. It's also sure. possible that where the, sort of a kink was about halfway up at, at the midpoint grounding kit. There could have been an, um, a, a real impedance mismatch there. Right. At the inter and, and For all we then, know, the you know, there's, I've seen issues where, you know, the, the outer, uh, you know, the outer of the, the transmission line is actually dented in and grounded out, but you can't tell because of the, you know, the vinyl jacket is still intact. Yeah. So, that's possible. You know, too, that, sure. that kind of thing can happen too. So I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, you know, uh, a, a lot of, um, Antennas, a lot of professional broadcast antennas, have what they call a pop-off valve at the top of them. Uh, some people agree with this notion. Some people say it's it's something else to go wrong, you know, a thousand feet up in the air or however tall your tower is. But the idea of a pop-off valve is at some pressure, like seven pounds or ten pounds, it will open up. And it will stay open until that pressure reduces uh, down to seven or six pounds. It's got a, a hysteresis about its design. I was just trying to work that word in during the show, hysteresis. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you can you can let you can push dry nitrogen through and thereby hopefully remove some uh, some moisture. Is that really effective? I, I don't know. We all think it is, and so uh, so we we do it. But there you go. That's 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 my story, and I'm sticking to it. So we're we're back on we, the back. Um, we actually had issues with our antenna. We had cracks cracks in the antenna. Um, so you're getting a lot of uh, um, air leakage there. So that was a pressurized antenna, yeah, which most of them are. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we our our feeder is a, a three inch feeder up our up the tower that we're on, and um, with an eight bay antenna array, and um, and out of the eight antennas, <laughs> I think about seven of them had developed a crack from a manufacturing fault, 
Um, but as you can imagine, the uh, cost in in uh, rigging and uh, that sort of thing to replace them, uh, it wasn't cheap. You know, at, at some point you do these cost analyses to see is it cheaper to send a crew up there or is it cheaper to buy a new tank of nitrogen every two weeks or is it cheaper to buy an air dehydrator and let it run a lot? You know, there's plenty of stations that have decided, you know what, we're going to keep running dry air through our system uh, until the problem upstairs gets worse. And, yeah. uh, you know, that yeah, may be well, the valid, reason uh, we knew that there was a problem was because the uh, air hydrator was just running constantly. <laughs> yeah. uh, whereas normally it would just switch on and off, um, you know, every you know, couple of minutes, five minutes. Uh, but it was just running constantly, so go. Oh, there's an issue. So we had to send some someone up, and uh, and that's what we found. So um, there's some good questions in the chat room that are coming up, and maybe we ought to address some of these. Uh, somebody asks. Um, so what uh, using foam dielectric coax at FM frequencies, is that good? Does it have you know, more loss? Is there any problems with doing that? You know, one of the reasons that uh, we use air dielectric coax is anytime you've got coax that's of, of reasonable size, and you, you know, a lot of FM stations, the smallest coax you would use for transmission is this inch and five-eighths size coax. Um, and then certainly goes up bigger from there. Uh, 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 Stephen, you just mentioned that you use some three-inch coax. You've got a higher power. Well, what's the power output from your transmitter feeding that three-inch? Uh, it's a 10-kilowatt transmitter, um, okay. and we actually have two antenna arrays on the tower. We have a 12-bay, uh, sorry, an 8-bay antenna array and, um, at the top of the tower, and then about halfway down, we have a 4-bay uh, antenna array. So there's, there's two runs of 3-inch uh, uh, coax down to the um, transmitter room uh, with a switcher. Um, the reason, reason for the two antennas systems is to allow for walkthroughs um, to do for any other work on the tower. Oh yeah, so if they're the, the, you're, this is for safety for the tower climbers, so they don't get hit with a bunch of RF. They climb past what the uh, the midpoint antenna, and when they get up close to the big antenna, then you turn it off and turn the midpoint antenna on. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we're on a, we're on a tower. We're at the top of the tower. Um, uh, to television stations, uh, DAB Plus for um, Sydney, and also uh, uh, there's four um, commercial FM services on the same on the tower. But our antenna system is actually ours. <laughs> to be on the tower, we um, yeah. have to provide our own antenna system. We should mention there's a lot of different ways to do FM uh, antennas, and, and because people do combine several stations onto one antenna, uh, you you can have a situation where you combine uh, several transmitters on the ground into one coax, and that goes up to a, a master antenna system. Theoretically, and I don't know if it's done anywhere, but maybe it is. You can you can have one coax going up that splits off to a couple or more different antennas. Uh, I mean, actual different frequency and antennas. Hey, uh, Chris Tobin, Chris Tar, you guys jump in here. Tell us a little bit about some interesting antenna and coax configurations that that you've seen. Oh, okay, I'll go. I guess I'll go first. Um, well, let's see. One that I had was uh, at the Empire State Building. We had a power divider, as you mentioned, the uh, single coax going up and then splitting between the two bays of the antenna. It's a two-bay panel antenna, as we talked about in the earlier episodes. And uh, there was a uh, kink in one of the uh, connecting cables. And uh, because of the combined uh, power of the radio stations that are on the antenna, the master antenna, which I believe, if memory serves me right, is uh, was it 12 duplexed antennas. So it was about 100,000 watts of RF that was going through a kink in the cable. And, well, needless to say, it put a hole in it, burned it out really well, and we all had to operate off the uh, broadband input on the backup antenna system that was uh, up on the building. And that made for an interesting couple of nights um, operating... When you're talking to the tower riggers on top of the Empire State Building at about 1,200 feet, uh, the winds are blowing at around 20 miles an hour, uh, trying to work inside the ironwork. And if you've seen the pictures of the Empire State Building, the very top spire, uh, if you look probably at the very top, it's a thin line, and then it opens up a little bit to what looks like a large cylinder-type base, and then you see the building itself. Well, just above that cylinder base and below the line it says which is the antenna mast is where the uh, work had to be done and it was uh, oh. it was wild it was so hot the, the the short circuit was so hot that it burned the teflon 
insulation inside the, uh, the connector. And if memory serves me right, to burn Teflon, it's at several thousand degrees or something like that. I, I got to look it up. It's a it was just fascinating. Yeah. It's a lot. Let's just put it that way. Teflon doesn't burn that easily, <clears throat> as we know. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. It made for interesting alarms and, and uh, v, uh, what do you call it? VSWR, reflected power and, and yeah. meetings, meters. <laughs> you name it. Every radio station up on the building was like, alarms went off. I'm going, what the devil? It just happened. And, uh, when you, and you get there and you're like, okay, we've got some SWR. All right, we'll check this, check that. And then, sure enough, when the tower riggers got up there the next night, <laughs> they called down on the two-way radio and said, well, you won't believe what we found, and it's going to be more than one night's worth of work. And it was. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> hey, well, you, know, you, you, got, you, yeah. you get to pull out all the test equipment, and you start doing measurements, yeah. and you know, it's a good camaraderie. It's fun, but it's not something you want to go through, just like you experienced with your cable separating from the tower. It's, you know, it's yeah. just a mess. Well. Uh, had it been done right in the first place, of course, that cable probably wouldn't have separated from the tower. And we're going to get to Chris Tarr in, in just a moment, but to get back to this question about foam versus air, uh, you know, in the in the in the cellular industry, in the two-way radio industry, the normal coax that's used is, is foam dielectric. I'm sure there's exceptions to that, but uh, most of it you'll see is foam dielectric. The problem with foam dielectric uh, coax um, is for most people is that if water gets inside of it, if there's a problem with an installation or a, a, a break in the outer conductor, or somehow if there's any ingress of water, you really can't get it out. You, you, it's closed cell foam, and water gets in there between the the foam and the outer uh, the foam and the, uh, the the outer conductor, uh, or the foam and the inner conductor, or within the foam itself. Or it's, it's, there's a lot of places it can get in, and and then you can't get it out. And you end up having to replace the whole line. Now, if you install it really well in the first place, you may never have water get into it. Um, broadcasters just have tended to use air dielectric line in the sizes where you do have a choice. And then when you get to larger sizes, well, you don't have a choice. It's all going to be air dielectric uh, line. And we say air dielectric, and you can you know, put dry air into it, but you can also put a gas like nitrogen into it, and that actually increases its dielectric value. You can actually run a little bit more. You, know, you increase the power rating of the coax that way. By the way, I was, uh, Stephen, you said you're running 10 kilowatts into 3-inch air dielectric line, and I'm, as memory serves, uh, that's that three inch line is that's I mean it's what you want but it's it's really kind of overkill. Uh, it's um, uh, the power rating of three inch line is quite a bit higher than ten kilowatts, isn't it? Yes, we um we allowed for uh, future expansion um, so that we could uh, ha uh, put it well for uh, putting a combiner and um, have somebody else using our tower or uh, sorry our antenna system at the same time. So. That's why we went with the three inch, um, just to allow for that capacity. That's a great idea. That is thinking thinking ahead. Hey, Chris Tarr, uh, you've worked at some stations. Do you guys have any combined antennas when you uh, were at the intercom stations? Uh, no, actually, we didn't. Uh, I did. I had one site, uh, the job before that in Illinois, where we had a couple of Class A's combined, but uh, not anything like a master antenna. What What are your comments about? Um, putting coax up right so it doesn't come down like it did at my station well you know i'm surprised you know like there obviously weren't any grounding kits or anything on there either because that would have probably have held it on well th uh, there, there were grounding kits and no they oh, didn't hold it on there uh -uh. now well th they weren't put you know look it, it, it's hard to find good help right so these grounding kits the lug that you're supposed to bolt to the tower um right. that was that was put on with a hose clamp <laughs> well, i'll tell you i did have I did have one situation where I had a uh, an auxiliary uh, antenna that was having some issues with SWR, and uh, I went outside to where the coax bends to go up the top, and I kind of moved it around, and I could hear sloshing. So I ended up <laughs> ended up drilling a hole in the bottom of the coax and water oh, yeah. pouring out, <laughs> and let that go for you know ten minutes. It's pouring out, pouring out, till it finally dripped away, and then you know I. You know, it, actually, all I did was ended up just patching up the hole and purging the line for a couple of days. I mean, I went through probably, you know, four or five bottles of of uh, of nitrogen, but uh, you know, it, it just ran just ran it wide open for a couple of days to get all the moisture out of there, and it's been fine ever since. Yeah, it's still there, and it works great. So you can recover from having moisture in the line, but you do have to, uh, you know, you have to you have to keep working on it, and and by all means keep the lines pressurized you know it's a pain because you know i've yet to run into uh, a line that doesn't have any leaks at all 
you know, they all have a slow leak somewhere. So, you know, always keep, uh, you know, dehydrators nearby or whatever and keep those lines pressurized because, you know, they'll, they'll go for a while without any problems. But that's, you know, that's so funny that you had that experience of getting to a station that had water in the in the bottom, like down in, in, in the drip loop, right, where you make a little yeah. loop at the bottom before it goes into the building. That way, when water, when it's raining, water doesn't just lead into the building. You've got this drip loop, so it goes down, and then it comes back up. And then into the building. Of course, if and the out rain outside the jacket, you know, drips off the bottom and doesn't come in the building. But this also is a great place for water to collect if it's inside the coax, which it shouldn't be. Yep. But you know, if it's leaking and you run out of nitrogen, and then, then you know, it, it can build up in there. So I had exactly the same experience. Uh, you know, slosh, slosh, slosh. Actually, actually, there was so much water in this coax that it presented a decent load to the uh, transmitter, and. Uh, so, uh, but the station wasn't getting out, and there was some reflected power bubbling around, literally. So I went outside, and just on a whim, I, I touched the coax. And you know how at the Mexican res restaurant they say, "Careful, this plate is hot." <laughs> Woo! This coax was just oh, it was hot. And, oh, God, no, just is that coax hot? No, it just uh, doesn't take me long to look at a piece of coax. Um, and, and so I ended up drilling a hole. I turned the transmitter off, of course. Drilled a hole in the bottom of the drip loop, like you did, and. Oh my gosh, water and steam and just uh came out for 15 minutes until it was all done. Then just like you, patched it up and away yep, we went. There you go. Hey, um uh we're going to hear from Stephen Wilkinson and his story about sometimes how sometimes all the redundancy in the world can fail you and you still have to figure out what you're going to do and and to come out to come out good at the at the end of the day. Uh but first, we're going to hear from our sponsor, our sponsor of this week in radio tech. Episode 141 is Omnia Audio. Now, I work for the folks at Omnia. I work for the Telos Alliance. That's Telos, Omnia, Axia, and Linear Acoustic. So there's your disclaimer. But it also means that, hey, I know something about the products. And I was just up at the factory uh, a couple weeks ago. In fact, I'm going uh, next week, too. Um, and I got a chance to spend some time with Cornelius Gould, Corny Gould. He is one of the masterminds behind the algorithms in the new Omnia 11. Now, there's some incredible tech in there from Frank Foti. There's great ideas in there from Mark Manolio and from one of the greatest uh, coding guys in the world, Rob Dye. These guys make up Team Omnia, and they have really put together something special with the Omnia 11. Now, you may have heard of the Omnia 11. Hey, Stephen, I understand there's a bunch of them down there in uh, down under in uh, Australia. Um, uh, yes, I've got an Omnia 11. Oh, you do? Well, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know you did. Um, yeah. I've yeah um, had it on trial for a while. The guys here are really good, and, and um, yeah, it's a lot of there's a lot you can do with it. So there's a lot of options. <laughs> well, one of the things that people um, uh, rave about the Omni Eleven. In fact, this was the the very first comment made by uh, the engineer who was trying out the first Omni Eleven, the prototype that we put on a commercial station. That engineer, his comment was, "It sounds effortlessly loud." Now, the problem with all the previous designs of audio processors, if you want to set to be louder on the dial, you actually had to you know, just process more and process more and, and uh, you know, do faster release times and faster attack times and, and get more into the limiters. And you had to get into the clippers where you were clipping the audio. And so it, to be loud, you had to sound like you were trying to be loud. Well, this is where the Omni 11 is actually different. Uh, the algorithms are, are designed, a very new approach to, to processing in, in some of the, of the ways that it works. It can sound loud. It can play just as loud as other guys on, on the dial without sounding like it's trying. And so what you hear is a lot of clean and clear audio that doesn't sound like it's all packed up and trying to be loud. This is uh, this is how you know uh, this is how David beat Goliath, right? Um, uh, something else about the Omnia 11. Up until recently, the Omnia 11 has been available in one version, and that's FM plus HD processing. And to be honest with you, the Omnia 11 is probably one of the most expensive audio processors on the market, if not the most. It's it's uh, it's got a pretty good list price on it. Well. For those folks who don't need, have no need at all for the HD processing component in an Omni 11, there's now a version of the Omni 11 that is discounted from the Omni 11 HD. It's the Omni 11 FM. So it only has the FM processing, but it's exactly the same solid new design FM processing that's in the Omni 11 FM plus HD, but it's at a substantial savings over the Omni uh, 11 plus HD. It's the Omni 11 FM 
Contact your Omnia dealer to find out more and find out what your price is where you live. And hey, your Omnia dealer might be able to give you a discount too. I can't speak for them, but they might be able to. So check as it well out. As you the can check it out. Sideband. Oh, that's right. It's got the uh, the 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 single sideband uh, function in the U.S. You have to uh, notify the FCC that you're using that. And uh, Frank Foti uh, has done a paper on that. It's on the uh, the website. Stephen, have you tried that out at your place? Yes, yeah, we've um, been using that, and uh, I drive a regular route to work and back every um, every day from home. And uh, whereas previously we would have a lot of um, multipath distortion at various stages on my trip, uh, now that I wouldn't say it's removed it totally, but uh, now it has reduced it uh, quite a lot. Um, and you don't get a you still get maybe a, a few glitch here and there, but uh, or you know slight static, uh, but uh, it's uh, doesn't totally sort of drop out from multipath distortion. We actually got to do one of our torch shows uh, on this subject. We had a guy named Paul Shulens from Greater Media uh, on our show, and he did a video, a before and after video with uh, the regular FM processing method. Um, and we've explained this on the show bef uh, before, but yeah, it's, we've got you've got left plus right, the stereo pilot, and left minus right. And left minus right is transmitted in the composite baseband uh, as a uh, dual side band amplitude modulated uh, suppressed carrier signal. And the whole idea of, of single side band is we get rid of the upper side band of that dual side band left minus right suppressed carrier signal. And by doing that, we actually eliminate energy in part of the spectrum that begins to cause us trouble with multipath. So, um, uh, so far, all the radios built after about 1973 when they introduced phase lock loop, all the radios we've tried it on work very, very well with this method. They don't need that upper sideband, and you do get a clear signal. So, hey, I'll, we'll wrap up the commercial by telling you again to check out the Omni 11. Uh, go, to, go to omniaaudio.com, and uh, you'll see all of our audio processes there. But just be aware that this uh, FM-only version is available at a substantial savings over the FM plus HD version. I think you're going to like it. And Stephen, thank you for your uh, uh, comment about the Omni 11. Very glad that, that you're using one there. No all problem. Right. No problem at all. <laughs> all right. Hey, all right. Stephen's got a story to tell us. And then I, I, I think that Chris Tarr may be able to follow up on this story uh, because of actually the day that Chris and I first met was September 11th. Uh, uh, 2001, when Chris was running around getting various backup systems going. So, Stephen, you take it away. You tell me uh, what you had in place and what went wrong. Well, of course, um, you know, an engineer, even though he's on holidays, is always on call. <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, this particular time was uh, it was a, a Sunday, which was technically my last day of my annual leave and uh, I was supposed to be back at work the next Monday. Um, I should preface this with that uh, we our transmitter site has a lot of automated function that if uh, STL receiver, a 850 meg, um, that's what we use in Australia, 850 meg STL, um, if that if it dropped out it'll switch to automatically to the second STL um, and then if that fails, um, it's supposed to dial an ISDN line um, back to the station. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have an IP remote f for that, and um, that was uh, had gone faulty um, a few weeks before, and so we were had that in for being repaired. So we couldn't remotely see what was happening at the transmitter site. So. So what happened on this particular Sunday morning, a, uh, the announcer rang me and um, uh, I don't know what he probably thought I was uh, what was uh, back from leave. Anyway, he rang me. Um, I do have a couple of guys that uh, you know assist me, but anyway, the announcer that was on air rang me and he said it was um, at six in the morning and, he, and we have a news bulletin at six. Um, and he said, oh, there's music playing and the news isn't going to air. Uh, when I listen to the, you know, the off-air feed, uh, the feed of what's being transmitted, um, there's just music playing and, and the news isn't going to air. I said, oh, that's strange. So anyway, I, um, I uh, rang the transmitter site, which has a 
24-7 um, uh, security. And I just got, because I couldn't remotely see what was happening at the site at the time. So I got the uh, security guy to uh, have a look at the STL receivers and and uh, said, is there anything um, showing any signal or any audio? And he says, no, no, can't, there's nothing there. And I went, oh, okay. So then I have to drive into the, the actual station and... Uh, and our, our transmitter site is um, probably about, normally about a 40-minute drive away from where the actual uh, studios are. And I live about 10, 15 minutes away from the studio. So I drove to the studios first, which is sort of on the way. And uh, that's where I went to our hut sort of here for our, where our STLs, are, transmitters are, are kept, and, uh, and both... Of them are dead, and hmm. our, our system, our system is that we've got we've got a main STL, and and then there's a redundant STL which will automatically switch to, um, from at the transmission, um, at at at, uh, at the studios, at our site, and uh, and, uh, and then as I said before, there's also an ISDN backup. Uh, so when I looked. The uh, main STL had died, and it had switched to the uh, second STL, but it had developed for some reason the same fault. Mm. Now we check these, run them alternatively, and check them month on and month off, sort of thing. Um, so the previous time that it had been investigated or you know checked, it was okay. Uh, so I went. So I went, okay, oh, that's no good. Um, so tried to uh, uh, then uh, dial the uh, ISDN at the transmitter site. And um, it would connect, but only for about 30 seconds and then drop out and connect and drop out. Again, I sort of rang the security guy there and said, is there anything uh, that you can see? And he says, oh, no, and, and not being technical. Uh, <laughs> makes it difficult. Um, so, uh, and what what was actually playing to where was our um, emergency program um, fail, uh, emergency program material. So at at, um, at the transmitter site, we've got a like a compact flashcard um, player that has um, our normal programming music programming on it. Uh, so that's what was playing to where at the time. Um, so, so I had to then drive then to the uh, transmitter site to look at why there was. I thought that the ISDN codec might have lost lost all its configuration, something like that. So I went to the transmitter site. As I said, is 30, 40 minutes drive away. Um, just fortunate that it was a Sunday morning, so that <laughs> there's no hardly any traffic. And uh, otherwise, in a sort of, if this was a weekday, um, that's just gridlock to do that, and it would be a two-hour plus trip um, by car. And um, so then, got to there, reprogrammed the ISDN codec, and um, it uh, again, it would still wouldn't lock for only thirty seconds. And then, um, unfortunately, I. I would have um, we we actually have spare ISDN codec, mm -hmm. um, which would normally be at the station, and I would have taken it with me, but um, we had loaned it to another organisation <laughs> um, to do a, um, a a live broadcast simulcast from the extra Sydney Opera House um, that we um, simulcast, and uh, so. So I had to get my spare ISDN unit back. Fortunately, the organisation um, was a open as 24-hour um, access. So I contacted them, which was another half an hour drive in the um, in a different direction to the other side of Sydney, and uh, I picked up our spare ISDN codec. Another half an hour drive. All all in the meantime, the um, emergency program. Um, was going to air, and um, and I knew that we had this important. We, this was a Sunday morning, and being a 
a, a Christian radio station as well. There was a special talk that was on at eight o'clock, so it was um, a mad rush to uh, get that program on because you know that a lot of people watch it and they'll be wondering what's happened to it and the switchboard will be inundated with calls of why isn't that on. Um, so it was a mad rush and got back to the uh, transmitter site, put in the different ISDN codec, dialed the station and right on the time of um, when that program needed to go to air, we, uh, we got it up and running again and had normal program. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of running around, a lot of work. Did, did, I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it, but did, did you ever? What turned out to be the original fault with the STL? Sorry, what, I lost what, you then. What, what started the problem in the first place? What was the original fault? The um, original fault was um, it was the uh, uh, um, the. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> the, it was just a part of the the uh, uh, STL transmitter. It was before the PA. Um, ah. it, it, it was a slight, I think, design issue that the uh, transistor was uh, running flat flat out power wise, um, yeah. and those trans those STLs are, um, were about eight years old, and um, so then that's what had happened. They'd both failed relatively close to each other um, and the same fault in both STLs. Um, we oh, okay. Um, okay. I uh, contacted a, an old um, ex-retired uh, um, engineer and uh, we, we had a look at it and uh, he, he made some modifications to get us by. Um, so we were only on ISDN probably for a couple of days and um, Oh, also, I was able to source a um, another uh, STL transmitter from from a, another station um, in in the meantime, and uh, so I, I ordered replacement a replacement board, and um, they'd actually in the in the replacement board they'd um, modified it or changed the uh, circuit. To so that this transistor isn't running at a f flat full, you know, fifteen volts um, sure, all the sure. time. So, so the manufacturer had a mod, uh, or so, you know, yeah, they had a, had yeah, a they mod had to modified make, the to make cards it, in, the, in the meantime. They probably had, um, had you know. and to, hey. uh, unfortunately, the the brand hadn't um, had, that. It was a UK brand, and uh, they'd been taken over by another company, and so we're fortunate to actually get um, some parts, and um, and it's with with the new boards. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that uh, this STL, the, the 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 ones that failed, were they um, uh, discrete or digital STLs? In other words, did, did they deliver left and right audio to your transmitter site, or were they composite? Yeah, they're com composite. Yeah, um, oh, okay. yeah, STLs. They're both composite STLs. Well, so th that that gives rise to this question then. And hey, Chris and and uh, and, and Chris could chime in here too. You know, one of the kind of difficulties about mixing uh, a composite STL with a backup system like an ISDN codec or nowadays an IP codec is with the ISDN codec or the IP codec, what you get at the transmitter site delivered is left and right channel audio, appropriate to run into a, uh, a, a, a processor at the transmitter site. What you get with a composite STL is you would usually you'd put your uh, uh, processing at the studio and run processed, ready to be transmitted FM analog audio through that composite STL. Does this mean that you have to have a processor at the studio for the main system and a backup processor at the transmitter site? Stephen? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, we... Yes, we process at the studio, um, and then it goes composite into the um, straight into our STL transmitter. Um, at the transmitter site, we have um, a stereo generator generator there, and um, but we feed our, which is probably not correct, but we feed our um, uh, uh, processed audio into our ISDN as just as because it is a, a backup path. Oh, okay. Which at least okay. gets okay. get it gets it on air, but it's um, it's probably modulation wise it would be down a bit because you haven't got the uh, stereo generator clipping 
um, limiter. So, um, uh, so yeah, so it's just a, a straight stereo audio feed out right. of the um, ISDN at the transmitter site into a stereo generator. And then the switching that happens at the transmitter site is a composite switch. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and we would know that that you know a uh, I take it that your ISDN codec or an IP codec is going to do bit rate reduction. You know, either through uh, Aptex or through uh, a Fraunhofer you know psychoacoustic model. And we know that if you feed highly processed audio into that, it, it the codec has a harder time deciding. Hmm, what audio am I going to throw away? Everything's loud. Um, uh, so it's better to feed you know non-processed audio into that. But hey, if it's a backup and this is what you're going to be on for a short period of time, eh, it's okay. So let me ask uh, uh, Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin. Let's ask Chris Tarr first. Uh, the, to me, this is a, a bit of a of a problem at radio stations when you've got a composite STL and then you've got some other system that's a left and right you know discrete STL. You, you almost end up having to have two audio processors, one at the studio and one at the transmitter. Yeah, and and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, and and typically what I see and what I've been doing is as we've been, you know, upgrading processors, for example, retiring, you know, 8100s, uh, you know, we put those out at the transitor site as a backup um, and then, you know, doing a composite switching. Uh, you know, generally, though, I've moved away from composite STLs altogether anyway with digital stuff now. So it's almost always left right and I can just do all the switching um, out at the out at the transitor site. Yeah, that makes sense. You, yeah, with with especially with HD systems, you end up needing to deliver uh, left and right, ideally to the transmitter side, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Chris Tobin, what about you? Has this been a, an, an issue for smaller stations or even bigger stations having to do this two uh, different ways? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I early on I had uh, you know composite STLs were popular, uh, you know, with the Mosleys and TFTs. Uh, what I did in a couple of places where we had very very minimal budgets. Uh, actually, did it was good. It was it was fun. It worked. But, you know, it was, again, it's just for an emergency or you know disaster recovery. Uh, what I would do is take the output of an ISDN codec and um, sum it together, and then feed it to the analog input of the exciter. So if the composite STL went out, I would uh, just dial up the ISDN it was being processed back at the studio, put it through. Of course, at the transmitter side, I just had a couple of diodes biased on the output so that there was a little bit of p clipping to sort of keep things in check. I'll uh, keep the modulation down so that you know I don't over deviate, and I can get back on the air really quick. Uh, that was one of the ways we had a little panic dial set up, so if we lost it, we can you know get up and running. Uh, we didn't have the luxury of extra uh, processors at the time. Uh, years later, yeah, as Chris pointed out, we retired some processing equipment, and we put that to transmit as the backup. So we had a couple of ways of doing things. Uh, you can get creative. You know, it's uh, it's all a question of what you know uh, when you do dis disaster recovery or you know broadcast continuity. What are you willing to protect? You know, what's the value? In some markets, you know, if you're off the air, mm -hmm, it may not be that bad. If you're not, you know, you're in a market that says, "Hey, we can't afford to be off," then you, you figure out the risk, and what it costs you, to maintain it. You know, Chris actually uh, Tar made this great point. If you if you have a composite STL and you have a a, a backup, you know, discrete left right STL, it forces you to have two processors. That forces you to have a backup processor. You have to. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a great idea. Put your older processor at the transmitter site. Let it be the tail end of the backup STL if it's a ISDN or, or perhaps an IP codec. And if you're still on a composite for your main, then that, that process is going at the studio. So, yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it. It really is the best, best way to go. So, um, yeah. hey, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to we, um, run, run uh, yeah, two. We have two processes at the studio um, for that reason as a backup and, um, and stereo generator. <laughs> um, and uh, we've, at, with uh, purchasing the um, Omnia 11, um, that's freed up um, one of our backup processes, which is actually an Omnia 1, uh, which I will look at putting in at the, um, tr probably at the transmitter site. At the moment, I've loaned it to a few stations um, to have a play with. Hey, Stephen, we're going to have you back on, a, on another show. You mentioned uh, in an email to me that you've got some really interesting pictures of some disastrous studios that you had an opportunity to go in and uh, fix up and put some new equipment in and make it look uh, uh, better. And not just look better, but probably be a little more reliable, yeah? Yeah, that's right. And a bit more conventional, I suppose, as a normal sort of on-air studio. Got you, got you. Hey, I, I want to uh, turn our attention back to Chris Tarr for a minute. Um, uh, Chris, you said that you were doing, you were manning the phones today. 
Uh, and uh, th this, I, I, just, I love this idea. Here you are, the engineer for this place. You're super well qualified, and yet you're getting some new challenges there uh, with some you know, different infrastructure. I know they're fundraising, and, and uh, the station you're working at, they seem to have a really good way of, um, so in a sophisticated but non-intrusive manner, keeping in touch with their donors and listeners, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, obviously being public, you know, being funded by members, essentially, and underwriters, um, you know, it, it's something that we have to do. And, and you know, we, we, you know, we even talk about it on the air. It's like, hey, we would much rather be playing music and, and not having, you know, not having to do this, but we know we have to. And, and that's kind of what happened. So, you know, we always say, Hey, if you guys donate everything in the first two days, we can end the fun drive and we're done. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and sometimes yeah, that we'd like to say that too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, but, but what I find real interesting about it is, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, to, to get on the phone and talk to somebody who, you know, is taking their hard earned money and saying, hey, I want to give you some because I enjoy what you're doing and, and we like what you're doing and we want you to continue to do it um, is a really interesting experience. And, you know, it's it's a whole different way of thinking about radio because, you know, we don't we're not in the business of selling ads to enrich shareholders. You know, we're in the process, you know, we're in the business of putting something on the radio that listeners will enjoy and want to support. So you immediately you know, know if you're doing a good job or not. So, you know, it's, it was a real eye opener for me, but yes, you know, one of the things I like about this job is although, as you mentioned, I'm very qualified. I mean, I, you know, I, as an engineer ran six radio stations, um, but it's a whole different kind of thing that I'm doing now. Uh, you know, hence the, the operations title as well. Um, you know, I'm still doing the engineering type things, but I'm also, you know, assisting with the overall, function and flow of the building with fun drives and all these sorts of things. So um, it's a whole new experience for me and I, I enjoy it a lot so far. It's a, it's a whole different kind of world, but everything we do, equipment, all this stuff is focused on the end result, which is the, the listener experience. We have a fantastic iPhone app. We have, um, you know, we, we, we do these uh, events that we invite our members to to participate in, you know, lot of these these kind of sound check parties and small, you know, little things. And we're building it. We have a new building. We're going to be building new studios with a performance area. So, you know, everything we do is focused towards the, the people who listen to the radio instead of making as much money as we can for our shareholders because you know we can't make too much money, otherwise we're no longer a nonprofit. So, um, oh, you, you just know, pay I the really do enjoy that. Buy some more equipment. What's that? You can pay the engineer more or buy some more equipment. Voila, not nonprofit. Well, you know, they uh, surprisingly enough, you know, the 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 pay is pretty similar to what I was doing before, and but but you know, it's a whole different reason for doing it. You know, yeah. whereas I, before I was a fireman, now I'm kind of the brains behind the operation kind of thing. You know, it's it's, you know, my job now is to think bigger than just keeping us on the air for the next twenty minutes, which is. It's it's different, uh, but I enjoy it. I mean, I love the fact that I can sit down and focus all of my attention on this one place, and making sure that it is the best it can possibly be. Because if if we're not, if for some reason our audio is bad, we can't keep the station on, the streams don't run, we're not serving the people who are paying us, which are our listeners. So um, it's a whole different way of doing things. And before I forget, I wanted to mention really quickly, we had a discussion going on about HD antennas um, in the chat room. Mm -hmm. uh, Navi and I were kind of going back and forth and I wanted to really quickly say to him because it's a lot easier to describe than type um, he was talking about a situation where a station was having uh, problems when they went from uh, you know minus 20 to minus 14 with their HD uh, signal where all of a sudden they were having all this self interference yeah. and we were kind of talking back and forth about what was causing that and he mentioned interleaved antennas oh. and here is what I wanted to say uh, and mention to him when you have interleaved antennas, whenever you have two separate sets of antennas for HD versus digital, or I mean HD versus analog, you have to model them. You have to send them out. You have to get them modeled to make sure that they work together and that they're tuned properly. Because what happens is you've got the nulls between, as the RF comes off the antenna, you have nulls, you know, as you go out away from the antenna. Well, if they're not, if the HD and the analog antennas aren't perfectly matched, those nulls land in different places. So it's very possible that on the fringe areas that you're talking about where they had these problems, the analog signal was in a null, 
and the HD signal was not. And the, you know, instead of having, you know, minus 14 ratio of HD to, to analog, it's opposite. So there you go. There's your lesson for today on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the relationship can change completely, especially out in the French. If they were getting problems close in, then I'd, I'd guess I'd look for more serious problems. But if the problems start occurring on the fringe, then that's really understandable with interleaved antennas. It's, it's yeah, going to happen. Got, you know, you've got things that will cause self interference. Are, are a few things. One is is a is a, a transmission system that's narrow banded, um, and, and sometimes you can do asymmetrical. Uh, sidebands that'll fix that. You know, for example, maybe it's, you know, if if your antenna is is you know a little more flat, you know, on the upper or the lower, you can adjust that. But almost always, it's either going to be you know antenna system, or I mean transmission system, or uh, something like that with antennas. Because theoretically, with HD and and if your your system is broadband, it doesn't matter how much power you're putting in the si- in the sidebands, it should never encroach on your analog signal. So. When you do have that encroachment, there's something else going on. Appreciate that explanation. It's very good. And, <laughs> hey, we need to have Stephen Wilkinson back to explain in Australia. They don't do HD. They do do DAB. And go ahead and take my camera here. And I know I got this thing back here. I'm kind of excited to have it turned on. This is um, this is my 300-millimeter coat. Good golly, that thing is bright. Holy cow. And it's not even running on uh, 220. It's running on 110. I'm not sure. I don't know what kind of bulbs in there. Can you get those bulbs for 110? 220, maybe. 221, whatever. It is. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe they are 110. I don't know, but well, that's okay. It'll last longer. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, nice you know what? Maybe they, they, maybe they are just 110 bulbs. Hey, uh, real real quick, Andrew Zarian may have a uh, a diagram to pop up here on the screen to show what this thing uh, looks like. There's this great cutaway view or a, a diagram of of of. Uh, the 300 millimeter code beacon. This particular one, one was put on whenever you want to, Andrew. This one was made by Huey and Phillips. It's called a. There you go. A 300. Oh, nice job too. A 300 millimeter code beacon. That's how the bulbs uh, rest in one of these things. I, you know, a lot of folks didn't know that the top bulb is upside down. Doesn't matter, I suppose. But the top bulb hangs upside down. The bottom bulb is right side up. And they're designed such that the center of the bulb, where the filament is, that tries to be right at the point where the the lens on the outside will focus the light out on the, the horizon because you know it just needs to be a few degrees wide most of the light so that an approaching airplane would um, you know will see the brightest part of the light and minimize the light going down to the ground so you won't see so much of that on the ground that you don't need to light up so hey sometime we'll uh, we'll talk more in depth about these but this thing's kind of fun I've, I haven't plugged this in in several years I I don't remember from which tower I stole this. I don't really remember. We were, how I we got were out one night drinking some moonshine, <laughs> and Billy Bob told me to climb that there tower. Climb that tower, snatch that coat, and off took off the light off. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, no, I got a better. It's the one we that were, something ran into. <laughs> we, we, yeah, right. We were in Mississippi, and one boy said, You know, I reckon I could shoot that light out with my shotgun. <laughs> Tell you what, rather than shoot it out, I'll just go get it. <laughs> so this go. is one of them stories that starts with, Here, hold my beer for a second. <laughs> Gosh. Now, try uh, maintaining what? a tower sites next to a law enforcement firing range. Oh, oh my I'll goodness. I'll tell you how many times that it replaced those lenses and bulbs. Ooh, ooh, wow. Hey, guys, we got to go. We've been on the air for an hour, and we've got another This Week in Radio Tech put away in the can. I want to thank so much our guest from down under, Sydney, Australia, from Hope 103.2 FM. And, uh, uh, Steve, we're going to have you back and describe some of your other digital systems you've got there. That's kind of where the future's going. So, Stephen Wilkinson, thanks for being with us. No problem. Glad to be here on, on the show. Um, I've got something for Chris Tarr I just wanted to show you. So, Unfortunately, I can't uh, see. So I, I can't see Return I know he's now. a fellow oh. Star Wars. <laughs> he's showing oh, you an art. It's a art pleasure to be on. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. All right. And Stephen, thank you for being on such short notice. I appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll do it next time on Equally Short Notice. How about that? Also, uh, uh, I want to thank Chris Tarr for being with us. Chris from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Appreciate you very much. Thanks for having me. And you're the, you hang out on the interwebs at what site? Uh, my the, the engineering website I have is the virtual engineer, broadcastengineering.info. You can also check me out on Twitter, at the Geek Jedi. You can check me out on Google+, Plus on Facebook. I am all over the place. You are. Just look for Chris Tarr. You'll find him. Or Geek Jedi. You'll find him there, too. And uh, Chris Tobin, thank you for being with us. If people want to find out about you, they'll find you and your fine products where? 
Uh, musiccamusa.com. All right. And I've been getting emails from folks as well, so it's, uh, you know, keep them coming. The questions are good. And I just want to make sure I thank Andrew. I'm going to do this. Do, do, do. Da, da. Ah, there you go. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> he writes thank you, guys. Board. All right. Hey, and thank you, uh, chat room, for being with us. Appreciate your comments. It's always good fun uh, back and forth there. Uh, and you can find us, of course, our, our new home at uh, gfqnetwork.com. Uh, we have our own uh, you know, page there. You'll find new episodes there. And, of course, you can also, uh, if, by the way, you can subscribe there. You can uh, get the iTunes link there, uh, the, uh, the feed burner feed and all that. You can download the MP3 version of the show. Um, it's, it's all available there. You can also go to the site that we've had since uh, day one, this week in radiotech.com. And you can do the same things there, but it all directs you back to uh, uh, the items the GFQ posts for us. Andrew Zarian, thank you so much. And thanks to uh, Omnia Audio on the web at omniaaudio.com for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. They've got the Omnia 11 FM only version at a substantial savings. So if you couldn't afford the uh, HD version, check out the FM version. I think you'll find it pretty agreeable. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This Week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you liked today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs>